Hi there, folks. Great to connect with you today. And for this morning's message, we have a special presentation, special guest speaker. It's our superintendent, Steve Harbridge. And this is a message that he recorded in the fall called Determining Worth. It's a great message. I'm sure you'll be blessed by it. He finishes the message with a time of communion. So make sure you have some uh, crackers or bread and juice ready to uh, share in that together with Steve. <clears throat> Should also take this opportunity to update you on our district and our superintendent. Steve actually uh, decided during this past term that he was going to be concluding his role, um, stepping into a retirement uh, phase of his life. So he's actually stepping out of the role as of uh, May 31st. And we're going to be electing a new superintendent at our district conference in June. So please pray for our wider district family, for God's wisdom and direction in all of that. May the Lord bless you as you enjoy this message from Steve. I want to, uh, I want to talk this morning about determining worth is the, the title of my message. And I want to share uh, this truth with you from my heart to yours. Uh, it is a truth that is uh, very dear to me, precious to me, and has had life-changing um, impact for me. And I hope and pray that it will impact your hearts uh, equally this morning. But I want to begin with a question. Actually, it's a kind of a two-part question. And it is, how much are you worth? And how do you determine that? How much are you worth? And how do you determine how much you're worth? Where does your mind go? Where did your mind go right now, just now, to find the answer to that question or to those questions? If you're like most people, your mind would go to your possessions, your net worth. Your assets minus your liabilities equals your worth. In fact, if you Google that question, that's what you'll get. Pages of sites like uh, salary.com, you know, how much you're worth based on how much you're paid, and uh, net worth calculators, and all of those things. So it seems to be that our natural default to determining our worth is based on our assets minus our liabilities. But is that it? Are we just the sum of what we own? Is that how we determine worth? Or maybe your mind went to your position in life. You know, your, your vocation. Maybe you're a manager, maybe you're a, maybe you're a president, or maybe you're a CEO, or maybe you're a lawyer, or a doctor, or whatever. Does that determine worth? Is our worth somehow affected positively or negatively based on, on our position in life? Is that it? Are we the sum of, of our title, our position? Or maybe, maybe in your mind it went to what you do, your performance, and how good you are at something. And maybe you calculate your self-worth based on how much better you may be at something than other people. Is that it? Is our worth determined by what we can do, being best at something? I think we can all agree that self-worth matters. It matters to our mental health, it matters to our emotional health, and it even matters to our relational health. People who have a low opinion of themselves, a low self-worth, will relate differently to, to others, will experience the inferiority and the insecurities in their relationship with other people and will, will treat other people differently. So will people who have a high or too high opinion of themselves and their sense of self-worth is higher than it should be. 
It affects us mentally. It, fa it affects us emotionally. Our personality is affected by our self-worth and how we determine our self-worth. Self-worth is that sense of value or importance or significance that we have. According to a study I came across, 85% of people struggle with issues of self-worth, mostly low self-worth. And there are multiple personality disorders associated with low self-worth. Things like low self-confidence and anxiety that's related to that, self-condemnation, self-judging, self-rejection, even self-loathing. There are, there are many people, and I've met many people in my life, that suffer with self-loathing because they have a low sense of self-worth. Even to the extreme, things like self-mutilation and suicide can be expressions of low self-worth. I came across uh, some inspirational quotes that, that I agree with, and I want to share a few with you. And one is, when you start seeing your worth, you'll find it harder to stay around people who don't. That is so true. When you start actually seeing what you're worth and how that worth has been determined, you'll have less tolerance for people who treat you worthless, who look down on you, and treat you as being worth less than them. Here's another one I like. When you know your worth, no one can make you feel worthless. <laughs> that is so true. But people will try to make you feel worthless. I don't know. It's a human thing. I don't know why we do it. Maybe, maybe because in the process of making someone else feel, feel worse, worthless, we somehow make ourselves feel worthy. Here's another one. This is a real good one. Make sure you don't start seeing yourself through the eyes of those who don't value you. In other words, don't let other people and how they see you in terms of your worth determine your worth. Don't start seeing yourself through their eyes because you will empower them to determine your worth. And then, this is a favorite as well, and one that I can personally relate to. Once you awaken to your true worth, life changes for the better. And this is my story. This is my testimony. I was the eighth born child in a family of 10 kids. We lived in a 1,000 square foot bungalow with no basement. So you can imagine what that was like. We were poor. At best, lower middle class. And we lived in a little house on the, literally on the wrong side of the tracks. And I knew it. I knew that my friends' houses were better than our house. I knew that my friends' fathers drove better cars than my dad did. I knew that I was worth less than my friends were, and I grew up with that insecurity and that uh, sense of inferiority because I allowed those circumstances and those people and this culture determine my worth. And I carried that insecurity into my adult years, even into my marriage. And it had all kinds of negative effects. And I still struggle with insecurities today. 
I, you know, I want to be honest with you. I'm not, I've not arrived. I'm not perfect. In fact, if we struggle with insecurities and low self-esteem, we are among the majority. 85% of us have this ongoing struggle. The other 15% just lie to you. A person who tells you they don't struggle with insecurity has such an insecurity they can't be truthful. We all struggle with a sense of low self-esteem or, in some cases, narcissism, you know, the other extreme. Uh, as Paul said, don't have too high an opinion of yourself. So personal worth and who determines our personal worth is the subject of my message this morning, and it's the subject of our text in Matthew chapter 10. And if you have a Bible, I'd like you to turn to this passage. There will be part of this up on the screen for you, but not all of it. I want to begin reading from verse 17, but I really want to focus in on verses 26 through 31. But let me begin in verse 17. So Jesus says, Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to the local councils and flog you in their synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings and as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will, it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Now pay attention especially to where he goes in this dialogue, in this teaching. He says, A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? And here's where I want to focus in. So do not be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the, roo the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very hairs of your head are numbered. So do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. So, what's Jesus saying? In short, what's the message? If I can paraphrase it or interpret it, what he's saying is, watch out. Be on your guard against people. Not just men, but be on your guard against people. Why? Because people will try to determine you to be worth less than them. And when they determine you to be worth less than them, they will reject you, and they will persecute you, and they will even abuse you. And then he says, you should expect that because that's how they have treated me. If they would treat me and consider me to be worth less and persecute me and reject me and abuse me, and I'm the teacher and the master and the head of the household, how much more so are people going to try to do that to you? But, he says, so beware, be on your guard, but don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of those people, of the them and the those. 
Don't be afraid of their opinions of you. Don't be afraid of those who are assuming to have the right to determine your worth. And don't be afraid of what they think of you. And don't be afraid of what they say of you. Why? Because, and this, please write down, please remember, please get this truth. This is a core truth. Get this in your heart. Because this is life transforming. Because people do not have the right to determine your worth or significance. God alone has determined your worth. God alone has determined your worth. Which then brings us to this key verse, and this is where Jesus lands this teaching. He begins then talking about worth. And he's, what he's saying in this verse 29 to 31 part is, men may determine a sparrow to be worth a half a penny. But God has determined them to be worth so much more. So much so that not even one sparrow will fall to the ground apart from the Father's will, outside of his care. And therefore, if that's how much worth God has put on a sparrow, how much more so will he take care of you who are worth more than many sparrows? This is, you are worth more. We are worth more. And I pray this morning, as Hannah said, that we will actually begin to see ourselves from God's perspective. Because when we begin to see how much we are worth from God's perspective, no one will be able again to make us feel worthless. So there are two ways, two common ways, or two primary ways of determining worth. One is called the comparison model. <clears throat> the comparison model, we're all familiar with it, is that worth is determined by comparing one thing against another. Right? So we talk about comparing apples to apples or oranges to oranges. In a former life, I used to be a real estate agent. I'm a recovering real estate agent. Just joking. And that's the model, the comparison model, was how we determine the value of a house. So if you were to call me as, your, as a, a seller and ask me to evaluate your house, I would use the comparison model. I would find homes that have been sold in your neighborhood or in your city, and I would compare them to your house, and I'd come back and say your house is worth X number of dollars. And that's pretty much the model we use for, for determining the worth of a lot of things. In fact, it's the model that we often use to determine our own worth, our self-worth. In things, as I mentioned, like possessions, we measure by size and quantity, so more is better than less, and people who have more are worth more than people who have less. And people who have bigger are worth better, worth more than people who have smaller. So we, we evaluate ourselves based on, you know, our cars and our boats and our houses and our, and our paychecks and all of those things. It's the comparison model. And somehow we try to find our sense of self-worth by comparing our possessions, by comparing our positions, our educations, by by comparing our performances, our skills, our abilities, more of these equal more worth. The Apostle Paul warns us against the comparison model for determining self-worth. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, 
And the New Living Translation interprets it this way, translates it this way. We wouldn't dare say that we are as wonderful as these other men who tell you how significant they are. But they are only comparing themselves with each other and measuring themselves with themselves. How foolish. The comparison model for determining self-worth is foolish. And not only is it, is it foolish, it is not sustainable. We all know it's not sustainable. If we are using the comparison model to determine our own self-worth, then all of these things that we use to determine our worth diminish in time or are lost in time. Aging robs us of them. Our skills are diminished. Our appearance is diminished. Our positions are lost. Sometimes our possessions are lost. And if our sense of self-worth and self-esteem is based on those things, then of course we're going to experience insecurity. Because our self-worth can only be as secure as the objects upon which it stands. But there's another way for determining worth. And it's called the fair market value model. And we're all familiar with this one as well, the fair market value model. Worth is determined by what someone is willing to pay for it. So back to the real estate example. I could tell a seller that his house is worth X number of dollars. But that's just my estimation based on comparisons. At the end of the day, that person's house is going to be worth what someone was willing to pay for it. Recently, my wife and I bought a, a house in a market here that is, was insane. We put an offer on one house. There were 10 other offers on it. It sold for 100000 more than the seller was asking. And we were told by friends and such, oh, that house is not worth that. Well, it is now. It is now because somebody was just willing to pay that price for it. And that's the model that Jesus is using here in this text. It's the fair market model. Because he says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Who's determined the value of those sparrows? The market has determined it. It's been determined by what someone's willing to pay. Someone's willing to pay a penny for two sparrows. So based on the fair market value, that's what they're worth. I remember reading, uh, you know, my son used to save uh, sports cards, hoping that someday he'd be rich. Actually, I was hoping someday he'd be rich. <clears throat> a sports card. Think about this. What is, what is a sports card worth? It's what comes in a pack of bubble gum that you pay under a buck for, for a number of them. It's two inches and a bit by three inches, a little piece of cardboard printed on both sides, not even printed well necessarily on both sides. What's it worth? Well, its intrinsic value is, I don't know, less than a cent, mass-produced, the, the material and such. But recently, or actually last year sometime, one of those sports cards of uh, Homer Wagner, I don't even know who he is. Homer Wagner played for the Pittsburgh Pirates for three years, from 1909 to 1911, and his baseball card went on the market for $3.12 million. That's insane. It's not worth $3.12 million. But yes, it is. Because someone 
was willing to pay the price. So I asked the question again, what are you worth? And how have you determined your worth? I think you know where I'm going here. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20, you were bought with a price. You were bought with a price. Sometimes we talk about salvation being free. Salvation, your salvation was not free. Oh yes, it's free to you. It's a gift to you. But it cost the Father a high price to purchase you, to redeem you. He bought you. He considered you worth the price. Others may say, she's not worth that or he's not worth that. But they have no right to determine your worth. You are worth that. In fact, you may say, I'm not worth that. But you don't have the right to determine your own worth. Your worth has been determined by the price that someone was willing to pay for you. You don't belong to yourself now. You have been bought. <laughs> you have been bought with a price. With a price. Imagine this scenario. So I'm a dad, I'm a father of one son, one and only son whom I love dearly. I love him more than my own life. In a heartbeat, I would give up my own life for his. And imagine this scenario. Imagine my friend, uh, Jeff. You all know Jeff. Jeff's my friend. I know you don't know that, Jeff, but I'm telling you today, you are my friend. And from what I've heard, Jeff's done some pretty, you know, stupid things. <laughs> Nevertheless, I like him. But imagine that Jeff goes on a holiday to Mexico. And while he's down there, you know, he befriends some people. And uh, he doesn't know it, but they're drug dealers. And they decide they're going to use this guy as a mule to get drugs back into Canada. So while Jeff doesn't know it, they put drugs in his luggage. <clears throat> and so Jeff goes to the airport on his way home. The drugs get found. He got arrested, thrown into prison, sentenced found guilty, sentenced to be executed. So, as his friend, I decide to go down to Mexico to advocate on his behalf. I want to try to get him off, and so I'm going to negotiate with the government, with the authorities, to try to get Jeff set free. So finally, in the negotiation, they say, okay, Mr. Harbridge, I understand you have a son by the name of Jonathan. We'll make you a deal. You bring Jonathan down and give us your son in exchange for your friend. Leave Jonathan with us and we'll execute him instead. Think about this. I got news for you, Jeff, and it's not good. <laughs> you are going to die. Because there's no way under heaven I'm giving my son in exchange for any of my friends. And here's what blows my mind. I just cannot fathom this. The father gave his son in exchange not for his friends, but for his enemies. I, 
I don't get, I can't get that. But that's the price. That's the price the Father paid to purchase me. How, how, what is, what am I worth? What I'm worth has nothing to do with my net worth, has nothing to do with the color of my skin. It has nothing to do with my position in life. It has nothing to do with what I'm good at. It has only to do with what the Father paid to purchase me. You were in captivity when the Father paid your ransom. That's, this is a real scenario. This is not imaginary. This is not make-believe. The Bible teaches us that we were in captivity in the kingdom of darkness, held captive under the control of the powers of darkness, and, ca and held captive by sin when the Father came and made an exchange for us, leaving his own son to be put to death and, and cast into hell, although it couldn't hold him. And he did all of that for me when I was not even his friend. I was his enemy. God help us. God help us get our minds around that. I don't know if we, if we can in our, in our humanity fully fathom how God sees us and how much he values us. Peter writes about it in 1 Peter 1.18 <clears throat> where he says, It was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were bought, but with the precious blood of Christ. You were bought with the precious blood of Christ. I love the way the message uh, translates it. It says, It cost God plenty to get you out of that dead end, dead end, empty headed life you grew up in. He paid with Christ's sacred blood, you know. He died like an unblemished sacrificial lamb. It's because of this sacrificed Messiah whom God then raised from the dead and glorified that you trust God, that you know you have a future in God. Here's the point this morning, my friends, my family. You are priceless. You are priceless. I'm not just trying to, you know, this is not just a motivational, you know, think better about yourself message. This is not about, you know, the power of positive thinking. This has nothing to do, in fact, with, with how you think. It has everything to do with what the Father has done to purchase you. You are priceless. The word priceless means having a worth beyond any earthly price. Invaluable. Beyond evaluation. There's nothing. So your worth can't be determined by comparison because there's nothing to compare that to. You are priceless. So here are the lessons that I want to leave with you this morning. And then we're going to celebrate communion together because communion is the reminder of this it is the reminder every time we partake in the Lord's table it is a reminder of the price that the father paid it should remind you of your worth please see yourself from his perspective let him determine your worth. So here are the lessons that I want to share with you out of this out of this passage. Number one, others don't have the right to determine your personal worth. 
Stop caring about what others think of you. Stop caring about what others say. Don't give them the right. Don't empower them to determine your worth. They don't have the right. Secondly, you don't have the right to determine the worth of another person. Stop judging them. Stop evaluating other people based on the color of their skin or the make of their car or the size of their house or the amount of their paycheck. Stop evaluating others by comparing them to yourself. You don't have the right. Stop looking down on other people and treating them as worth less than you. Because God paid the same price for them. Not just Christians only. He paid the same price for the whole world. He paid the same price for them as he paid for you. And then the third, and this is maybe the hardest. You don't have the right to determine your own worth. Stop self-loathing. Stop criticizing yourself. Stop with the self-condemnation. Stop saying I'm worthless because I can't do what I used to do. You know, seniors have a big problem with this. A diminishing sense of worth because they can't do as much as they used to. They can't, they're cognitively not able as they once were. But stop the condemnation, the self-condemnation, the self-rejection, the self-loathing. Stop saying you're worthless. When you say that you are worthless, you are diminishing and despising the price the Father paid for you. You are priceless. And in his eyes, you are worthy. He bought you, and you were worth it. And if he had to do it again, and needed to do it again, he would do it again. God alone has determined your worth by the price of his beloved son. Which brings us to the significance of communion. As you look at these emblems, the bread and the juice, Jesus said, as often as you partake of these, I want you to remember me. Remember what? Well, in short, <clears throat> remember that the Father determined you to be worth this price. You were worth the sacrifice of his only son. And to Jesus, you were worth his life, his participation, his willingness to be the price. What, what could possibly add to our worth? There's nothing. <laughs> this is the thing. It's, this is security. Because no one or nothing can take that away from us. No matter if we lose our possessions or can't perform the same anymore or we lose our position for whatever reasons, nothing can diminish your worth your self-worth, your personal worth, if it is based on this, on the price, the price that was paid for you. God has determined. Remember it. As we partake today, remember this. The Father has determined you to be worth the sacrifice of his only and beloved Son to purchase your freedom. So the Bible tells us that on the night that he was betrayed, 
he took the bread. Remember, just the little thin one. He took the bread, and when he had broken it, and given thanks, he said, this is my body. This represents me. This is my body, which was broken for you. Therefore, when you eat of this bread, remember. Remember the price. As you eat with me today, whether you're here at home, I want you to take a moment of just quietness and tell yourself this truth. I, I hope it's up on the screen. Yes, it is. Tell yourself this truth. The Father determined me to be worth the sacrifice of his only beloved son to purchase my freedom. Okay, let's just take a moment and give the Lord thanks for the price that he has paid. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We can't fathom it. I think that's probably why Paul talks about the height and breadth and depth of the love of God, which is beyond understanding. We, I can't understand it. I, I can't relate to it. I can't compare it. There's nothing, there's nothing that I can compare that to. It goes beyond. But, Father, you have loved us, and you have loved us so much that you have purchased our freedom. You bought us with the precious sacrifice of your son. And as we eat of the bread today to represent his body that was beaten and broken for us, we do it with thanksgiving. Thank you, Father, for giving Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for being the price. And we partake together with thanksgiving now. Amen. Let's eat together. In the same way, we are told, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant between God and you, sealed by the shedding of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus, we thank you today for the power of your shed blood. You gave your life in exchange for us. You died in our stead. You became our sin so that we could become your righteousness. And so I pray for us today as your people that you would transform us that our lives would be changed for the better because we have a more clear understanding of the worth you have determined for us. How can we compare it? It is priceless, and therefore we are priceless. And so we drink today with remembrance and with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's drink together. Lord, let me leave with this prayer this morning that you would open the eyes of our understanding today that your truth would be powerful in setting us free. I know there are people, at least 85% of the people, that are in, in a hearing range of my voice this morning who struggle with their sense of self-worth, <clears throat> myself included. But today I pray that we would have 
a, a fresh revelation, a different perspective that we, in fact, as Hannah said, would see our, ourselves and each other and the people around us from your perspective. They were bought with the same price we were bought with, the precious blood of Jesus. And for all of this, we give you thanks forever. We praise you forever. Amen. What a great message for us to hear from our outgoing superintendent, Steve Harbridge, about the value God places on us in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, and give you peace. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together as we close our service, shall we? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you folks so much. Have a great day. We'll see you next time.